Okay, uh, we're about to get started. There will be more people coming in, but we will first uh, do some intro slides. So uh, hopefully there will be uh, more people joining uh, later. So welcome to this uh, second uh, webinar, QGIS Hydro webinar, together with uh, Kurt. For seven weeks long, we will uh, show you some tips and tricks from uh, the book QGIS for Hydrological Applications. And uh, we're now in the second one. And of course, at the end, we'll have our uh, geo beers like last week. It was great fun. So let me first uh, introduce myself for uh, the people who are new. So I'm Hans van der Quest. Um, I'm a physical geographer from background. I studied at Utrecht University in the center of the Netherlands. I also did my PhD there and um, I studied the integration of satellite information in uh, soil moisture modeling with uh, field studies in uh, Morocco and Spain. And then I started working as a researcher at the Flemish Institute for Technological Research in uh, Belgium. I was in the environmental modeling uh, unit where we worked on uh, water quality and land use change models. And uh, since 2012, I work at IHE Delft Institute for Water Education as a lecturer in ecohydrological modeling and uh, teaching GIS there, of course, and, uh, and modeling classes and uh, do the field work. I'm also a board member of the Dutch uh, QGIS user group. And in my work, my ma main interests are, of course, open source GIS and modeling. Like uh, Kurt, I'm a uh, QGIS certified instructor. So all the courses that I give with uh, QGIS, um, the participants can get the official QGIS certificate. And uh, in that way, you contribute also to, uh, uh, to QGIS because each uh, certificate is worth a 20 euros donation to, uh, to QGIS. And for us as an institute, is a way to support uh, QGIS. Um, I'm also very much interested in remote sensing for hydrology. We do a lot uh, about that at IHE at the moment for water accounting and water productivity. They also have a lot of nice open materials uh, at different channels. In my uh, capacity development projects, I work a lot on uh, data sharing and fostering or uh, promoting the use of open data for the water sector, also through spatial data infrastructures. And uh, we use a lot GeoNode, which is a nice uh, software stack that integrates all the components of uh, spatial data infrastructures that you need to share the data. And of course, fieldwork. Uh, you always think uh, that, that we are nerds and we are nerds, but uh, the data for collected in the field is very important. So you also need to know what's going out there. And I find that a lot of GIS people are out in the field. And of course, in these times of the, the corona crisis, we, are, we feel a bit stuck in the, in the office. But the combination of, uh, of field work and GIS is really uh, a nice one. And there are also nice tools like uh, from uh, Lutra Consulting with the uh, input app that you can collect uh, data in the field and connect it uh, to, uh, to QGIS. That, that's all very nice stuff. By the way, Lutra Consulting is uh, sponsoring this uh, event by uh, supporting a big amount of users uh, to, to take part in these uh, webinars. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, you can send me an email or connect through uh, social media. And, uh, happy to uh, be in touch with you. I'll give the floor to uh, Kurt. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kurt Menke, and uh, I have a master's from the University of New Mexico. Um, and I run my own GIS consulting business named Bird's Eye View. I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the United States. I also have a fairly new venture that um, I started with some colleagues about a year ago called the Q Cooperative. And it's myself and half a dozen um, developers and power users and teachers uh, providing QGIS support services. So if people need a, a new QGIS feature or a custom plugin or something like that, um, we can help. I'm also an OSGO charter member, and it's hard to believe, but at this point I've written six books on QGIS, and the latest two are Discover QGIS 3X, which is a really large 400-page um, complete treatment of QGIS with 32 different lab exercises that people can go through, and QGIS for hydrological applications with um, Hans, which uh, we're going to go through the check -in, second chapter of today. And um, I do a mix of just about everything. I focus mainly on ecological conservation and public health, and I'm definitely a Phosphor G advocate. And if you're interested in um, messaging me or following me, um, I'm Kurt at birdseyeviewgis.com 
or you can find me um, a geomenki on Twitter. Thanks, Kurt. So um, there are seven webinars. So we also want to get you through these tough times that we're all a bit locked in in our house. But uh, yeah, never waste a good crisis and learn some good new skills. And uh, we also like to, to meet you and uh, through the internet. And I think this is a great opportunity. So the first one was on preparing uh, data from hard copy maps and digitizing. Um, the video is uh, on my YouTube channel if you still want to watch that first webinar. Today we're going to talk about importing tabular data into QGIS. Next time we'll um, demonstrate how to do spatial analysis with map algebra, so mostly with raster data. Then uh, the fourth webinar is about stream and catchment delineation, very important topic for uh, people in hydrology. In the fifth webinar, we'll show how to add open data to the catchment uh, from all kinds of web map services and from OpenStreetMap. Then the sixth uh, seminar is about, uh, or webinar is about calculating the percentage of land cover per subcatchment, where we will introduce a lot of uh, vector analysis uh, tools. And then the last one is, yeah, how do you design a very nice map, like the one that we have on the cover of our book, and using all the great tools that are available in uh, QGIS for that, and, and Kurt will get you through that uh, part of the webinars. Um, it's always a good idea to have the book next to uh, the webinars because all the steps are explained in the book. And uh, if you want to order the book, you can go to this link, lowkitpress.com slash slash hit. And uh, there you find uh, the information to buy the ebook or the, or the hard copy. So for today, we will uh, import tabular data. And uh, with QGIS, you can import tabular data from comma separated files. And then it comes with a native importer, which uh, is this symbol. I will demonstrate that later in, in QGIS itself. Um, but what's also useful is use the Spreadsheet Layers plugin to import spreadsheets, like from Excel. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate uh, too. What is important if you want to import tables into GIS is that you need, uh, of course, tables with coordinates. Only with coordinates we can put uh, the, the rows that we have in our table uh, on the map. What's also important because a table or a spreadsheet is not GIS is that we need to know what the projection is of those coordinates because they are not always stored in the table. Uh, so there needs to be some metadata or you need to in some way find out uh, from the headers of the columns what kind of coordinates uh, are in the tables that you want to import. And then after importing uh, those tables, you need to convert it, convert it to uh, an appropriate GIS format that you can further handle in GIS. That's one thing that we're going to do. The second thing is we will, in this uh, exercise, have two tables. And one table has the coordinates, as you can see here on the, on the right. And the other one has uh, the temperatures, but in some strange units. Uh, on purpose for this exercise. And uh, we see that they both have a common column. And what we want is, of course, to link the coordinates to the temperatures and put them in the GIS and to do further analysis with it. So basically what we do is, um, that's called a join operation. So based on this uh, station number, we can, in GIS, easily combine the two tables, join them, and then uh, work further with that joint attribute table and do some corrections on that. So like here, you see missing data. And you see that the units of the temperatures need to be converted. So we're going to work on those things today. And then the last step of this exercise is to go from our point data to uh, rasters. Because for hydrology, um, it's often in our models important to work uh, raster-based and uh, meteorological data, like in this case temperature, but it can also be rainfall or other kind of data is collected at points and you want to interpolate it to rasters. There are many methods, we'll introduce a few and give you some hints where to find more. And uh, on the way, we'll also style this data so you in the end uh, see a map similar to this. We'll also discuss uh, the two interpolation methods to interpret them, but also to uh, discuss which one was now the best to use. So I hope you're ready for that. And then uh, we can switch to QGIS. If you have any questions during the uh, demonstrations, then uh, please put it in the chat. At the end, we will have some a plenary where we can summarize things. And uh, after that, we will have the, the geo beers. First of all, when you want to import uh, spreadsheets, it is important that you uh, look at the spreadsheets uh, yourself. So I'm going to 
go to a folder where I have um, the spreadsheets. So we're going to first look at the two Excel sheets that I want to import into uh, QGIS. There's one which is called KNMI stations. It's uh, just an Excel file and there indeed we see the station numbers. We see long lat, that's uh, longitude latitude. So we have the coordinates and we can put them on uh, the map. There's altitude and there's the names of the stations. And then the other one contains here the station numbers and the temperatures. And then those temperatures we can convert. Of course, we can already uh, join these tables in Excel and uh, correct uh, the values, but uh, I will show you that it's also very powerful to do those things in GIS. And later I will show you how to import the CSV. So I'm going to switch to QGIS. Um, for importing spreadsheets, we need uh, to install a plugin. So I'll go to the plugins menu and manage and install plugins. Connects to the repository. And there I'm going to look for the spreadsheet layers plugin, this one. In my case, it's already installed and checked. And this will add here under layers, add layer, add spreadsheet layer. So I can browse to the spreadsheet. And I'm going to first import the one that has the coordinates, and that's KNMI stations. When I open it, it fills in the data already in this uh, table. And uh, you can choose if it has different sheets, you can choose here which sheet you want to look at. And here you can modify the layer name that will be displayed in your layers list. So I'll just call this table because it's not yet in a GIS format. Uh, when I import it, it's some virtual file which will be stored in the same folder. But to not get confused, I call it table. And this one has a geometry. And it guesses already that the x comes from the longitude and the y from the latitude, so that's okay. If you want to import also the, um, the coordinates, you can check here the box show fields in attribute table. Normally you don't want that because the geometry in the vector files is separate from the attributes. But if you need them, then you need to check that box and then those columns will also be imported in the attribute table. Then the reference system, that's very important. So it's a longitude latitude. So we need to define here that it is in EPSG 4326. And last time you learned that you can just put the EPSG code here. There's a new video which shows how to find uh, EPSG codes, but 4326 is the one that you should always remember. It's latitude longitude on WGS84. So now when we import it, um, the layer will have this projection. Another important thing to do is to declare um, the data types. So the station numbers are not real, they are integer. Longitude and latitude are real numbers. The altitude is real and we have then the names of the stations as strings. That's it basically. So when I click OK, it will load the points on the map. Here you see it. And uh, what is always wise to do is to check if this is really fitting with uh, reality. And uh, therefore, we have uh, the Quick Map Service plugin where we can add maps from the internet. And I said also last time, yeah, you, you cannot blame these worldwide maps all to be in the wrong projection. You're in the right one. So this is basically your, your check if uh, your data is in the correct projection. So I open the OpenStreetMap and it should give me the contours of uh, the Netherlands. And yeah, it's there with our points on it. We're going to make it nicer in a bit. The next step is to uh, import the other table. I'm going to uncheck this for a while. Um, so same way, layer, add layer, and add spreadsheet layer. And I'm going to browse to the other file, this one, which doesn't have a geometry because there's no x and y coordinates in it. It's uh, just a station number and uh, the date and the temperatures that we are interested in. And you see already there's some missing data. So I'm gonna rename also this uh, layer. So I'll just call this uh, temperatures table. So we don't get confused later of what's what. I don't check the geometry and I declare station numbers as integer. The date, we're not gonna do anything with it. So it's okay to keep it also as uh, integer. 
there's a special date time format, but uh, then you need to really have the things in the right format for here. It's not important. And the temperatures, we keep them on real. And then I do OK, and then our table is imported. You can also drag and drop your tables in here, but uh, then you have less control on the formats and the data type. So the preferred way is to do it in this way, that you're really sure what you are importing. So I can also open this attribute table to just check it. And here it is. We see it's well imported. And do the same with the uh, stations. It's there. Data types are OK. It looks great. The next step is to save this one, which you, if you hover your mouse over the layers, you can see um, where it's stored. And this one is stored in a VRT file, which is more or less a temporary file on your, on your disk. And um, by clicking right and choosing export, we can do two things. We, we will save the features in another format. So last time we used the geo package. In this uh, um, webinar, I'm going to use the, the shape file. Geo package is preferred, but just to show you also the different things. In fact, you can choose your many different output file formats. They come from, uh, from the GDAL uh, uh, library and from the OGR. So you can also save it to a Google KML file, for example. Here we stick to the shape file this, uh, this time. Always use these buttons to browse to the folder where you want to store it. So I'm going to store it in chapter two. Otherwise, it stays in some previous used folder. So it's always good to use the buttons instead of typing the file name here. And I'm going to call it KNMI Stations. And it will be a shape file and there it will be saved in the end. In this dialog, you can also change the projection. Since we are working with data from the Netherlands, meteorological data from the, the Met Office, open data, I'm going to change the projection to the Dutch one. And well, it's already in the recently used one, but if you don't have it, again, you can type here the EPSG code of the projection that you need. So this is the one that we use in the Netherlands, the national projection. And I click OK. And that's all that we need to uh, fill in here. And when I do OK, it will ask for the datum uh, transformation. We can uh, keep the defaults here, so I just do OK. And then it says it's successfully imported, uh, exported to the other format. And uh, when I hover my mouse, I can check which one is which. So if you confuse the names a bit and you're not sure, then uh, you can see here that this one is the shape file and the other one is the virtual file. To avoid further confusion, I always keep my layers list clean. So I'm going to remove this, the virtual file. Don't remove the other one. And there it is. And then uh, I'm going to do the join because we want the temperatures of this attribute table added to the shape file. So to do that, we click right and we choose properties. And that brings us to the layer properties. And then there's this joins button and you can add a join if you click the plus symbol. And the layer I want to join because I started the join from the KNMI stations and I'm in that layer properties. I will get the join from another layer. If you have multiple, you can choose it here from the list. In this case, it's the temperatures table. And the join field is stations and the target field is also station, so that's the common column that you're going to use for joining the attribute tables. There are a few more things you can do in this dialog. So you can choose which field you want to join. And I want to join only the temperatures. I'm not interested in the other ones. And I can choose a custom field name prefix, and this one is too long, so I'm going to shorten it a bit. I'll just call it temp. Um, this is nice because then you see which columns come from the other file. So they get this prefix in the attribute table. Then I do OK. And uh, here you can then see an overview of the join that I created. And I do OK. And there's the join. If I now go to the attribute table, then I see that it has station, altitude, 
name of the station and the temperature in the strange units from the other table. So that was the first step to join. These joins are always um, linked to your project, but not in the file itself. So it's not the case now that KNMI stations contains these values. It will only contain its own values and what we're gonna derive from the joint values. So if I'm gonna edit, add new columns, those will be in the file, but the join will get lost when I close uh, this project and I open the file in a new project, or if I remove and add the file again, then the join is lost. So it's more comparable to a relate in uh, ArcGIS for ArcGIS users. A way to preserve the join is again to export the file, then you get all the columns, including the joins. It will create a copy, including the joins. So that's good to keep in mind when you work with joins. The next step is to uh, clean up a bit this uh, data because we have some uh, no data in here. So I toggle to editing mode. Remember from last time, we can toggle to editing mode in different places and then the symbol at the layer becomes a pencil. It means you're going to edit something in memory and it's only in the file as long as we click the save button. Uh, that's the same for your attribute table. So I'm gonna look for these no data files, uh, no data uh, features. And I use the control button to select multiple of them. And then I use the trash bin to remove them. And now they're gone. And then I save and then it's in the file. The next thing I'm going to do is to convert these temperatures to the normal units because this is in 0 0.1 uh, Celsius. So I have to add another column. It's here. If you hover over these buttons, you see what they mean. So this is to create a new field. Fields are the columns in the attribute table. And I'm going to call this TC. And that is temperature in degrees Celsius. That's a decimal number. And length, it means the amount of positions, the amount of characters of the number. So in this case, it's uh, three. And the position is the amount of decimals. And I want one decimal because I'm gonna divide this 162, for example, by 10 to get 16.2. That's the conversion we're going to make. To do okay, the new column is added. What's important then is to do the calculation and I can choose here the output column. Now that's an important step because by default or by accident, you can have the wrong column here and then it will write the result of what we're going to make as an equation to the wrong column. It happens a lot in class. So here you always need to read this line here, the field calculator as an equation. So TC equals something. You can write the something here, but you can also click this button. That's to start the di dialogue of the field calculator, the expression dialogue. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that we want to divide this column by 10. So I go to fields and values, where you see the list of these columns. And I simply double click on the column name and then it enters it here in the dialogue with double quotes. So the fields are always in double quotes. And then I can divide it by 10 or multiply by 0 0.1. And you can always check the output preview. If it doesn't get give an error, then, uh, then it's a correct equation. And this makes sense, 16.2. So I can uh, con continue with this one. So I do okay. And now the equation is written here. So make sure it goes to the correct column. And then I do update all and the equation is applied to each feature in the attribute table. So if you're happy with it, you save the file and you toggle off the editing. So what we did was uh, correcting now the temperature values. So we can uh, proceed with that. Um, before I proceed with that, I'm going to show you just as a little intermezzo how to import a comma separated file. So there's a native importer uh, in QGIS to do that, but also good practice with comma separated files is that you check 
the CSV file. So we've created already a bunch of files here. And this is a CSV file. And by default, Excel uh, will open it if you have your standard Windows settings. And it even puts an Excel icon. But please remember that the CSV file is, is a text file, which you can open in any text editor. So if I click right, I can simply say open with Notepad. And it's very important to do that, to look at your CSV files that you get out of Excel, out of your models, to look at the format, because they are often depending on your language settings on your computer. So if you are from uh, non-English uh, languages, uh, like Dutch or Spanish or French, then the decimals are separated with a comma. If in Excel, your language settings are on, on, on Dutch, then it will output not a comma separated file, even if you choose comma separated file, it will use semicolon because otherwise you have commas already here and then you get your column breaks at the long, wrong places. So therefore it's always wise to check what comes out of your models, your tools that use comma separated values. So here we simply see that it's separated by commas. So you don't need Excel for that. <clears throat> Go back to QGIS. And you can find the native importer here under the Open Data Source Manager. And <clears throat> there you have this button, delimited text. And I can open here uh, the CSV file. Default comma separated, but if you have other ones, you can choose here custom delimiters and you can set whatever it is. Here I switch back to the CSV format. And you see here the preview window, so you see that the breaks of the columns are already at the right spot. You have the geometry, its points, and it identifies the longitude and the latitude. You always check it, and you fill in the geometry. So it's very similar to the other uh, dialog of the, the spreadsheets. And uh, when I click OK, or Add in this case, it will be added. And there we see also when I hover over it, that is again a temporary file which you can export then to um, Shapefile or Geo Package or something else before you continue. Okay, I'm going to remove this layer because we're not going to use this one. That was just a demonstration. Um, so the join is in fact in memory and we have joined, just to, to make clear what a join is, we have joined this one to this table and we've calculated that field. Now, if I remove this table, the join will be broken. And let's see what happens. So I'm gonna remove this. I'm gonna open the attribute table. And there you see that only what we have calculated and what was there remains. So if you want a complete attribute table, including the join, as I said before, you need to export it first. Then it makes a copy with all the columns, including the joints. So that's good to remember. So this is the Netherlands with uh, the MET stations, um, with the temperatures in the attribute table. But this, for people from the Netherlands, this doesn't look like the Netherlands. That's because of your on-the-fly reprojection. It's on latitude, longitude, on geographic coordinate system. So I'm going to change it. You can click here. And then in this dialog, I can now choose the Dutch projection. So the on-the-fly reprojection, make sure that any layer that you load in the map canvas is on-the-fly reprojected to the same projection. Normally, it takes the one of the layer that you use first in the map canvas. So if you later want to change it, you can do it through this, uh, this button or uh, go to the project properties from the menu. Now I'm going to style uh, these vectors a little bit before we proceed with the interpolation. Create some space here. So I open the live uh, layer styling panel. I'm going to move these a bit away. <coughs> and a uh, single symbol that uh, could be used, but we want to see the, the temperature gradient. So I go here to graduate it. And I need to choose the column. And of course, that's the TC column, the temperatures column. And I need to choose a color ramp. So there are many ramps provided and uh, we can use the, the spectral one. But um, the problem is that the spectral one starts from red and goes to blue, which is not really intuitive. 
because yeah, we associate cold with blue and red with warm. So if you click right on the ramp, you can invert, invert the color ramp to classify it again. And then now we see that red is warm and blue is cold. That's what we want here. I'm gonna create some labels. And I'm going to use a single label. And by default, it takes now the field of the name of the MET stations. But I'm going to do something a bit more sophisticated. I'm gonna show you also the temperatures. So we can also plot the temperatures here, but what if we want the name and the temperatures and the units? Then we can go to this button here to open uh, again the, the dialog for, uh, for editing the expressions. I'm gonna remove what was there. So what I would like to see is the name of the station. So I go to fields and values. I double click on name. You see in double quotes now the name is added and the preview gives there the name of the first uh, field, it's uh, Falkenberg. And I'm going to concatenate. So you learned last time that you can add strings, connect strings uh, using this button. We also learned that we can go to a new line with this button. So that's what we're gonna do. So on one line in the label, I will have the name of the station. On the next line, I will have the units. So I'm gonna concatenate. And I can type a string here with single quotes. So now we have C, but in between, of course, I need to put the temperature here. So now we have Falkenberg 16.2 C. It's not yet degrees Celsius, and now a little trick for that. That's a little extra that you get. We don't have it in the book. Uh, if you want a degree symbol, that's not a standard symbol on, on your keyboard, but there is this uh, string function. So you can, you can browse to all these functions here. You can do quite a lot with this, like um, calculating the length of a line or the area of a polygon. You find these under, under geometry. But in this case, we need one string function and there's this character function and it returns a character associated with the Unicode code. So character 81, is Q if you want to write QGIS in these Unicode characters, which is a bit complicated to do, but then you use this character. So there's one for degree Celsius too. So I can add it here and double click on character. And the number for that is 176, if I remember well, close the brackets and concatenate with the string. And now I don't want space anymore. So here we have it, Falkenberg 16.2 degrees Celsius. Do OK. Now we see that it's uh, adapted. And I'm going to change a few uh, settings here. Uh, I would like to have another font here. Let's use uh, Calibri. And one in bold. 10 points is OK. And uh, go here to the placement. Uh, I would like to see here that the alignment is uh, centered. See, that looks nicer. Now we have the temperature centered under the name of the station. Also want to draw a little uh, buffer to make it clearer. And we can work on the distance. We can make it a bit larger. You can play with this. You can see it live uh, changing. Make it two units, and it's a bit further away. And you learned last time that with this uh, button here, you can go to some extra automating, automated placement engine options. And here you can remove this, allow truncated labels on edges of the map. Now not much will change, but if I will move this here, then it will make sure that the label moves to the side. If I didn't have that box checked, then it will just move out of the map. Yeah, I can show that to you. So now move this here. You see now it's overlapping with uh, the window. So that's also important for uh, when you want to style your map, 
that this uh, button is unchecked and then your labels will be moved automatically. There's some uh, manual adjust, uh, adjustment methods for labels that you can explore. Um, then the next step is to interpolate these points to raster. And therefore, I'm going to change a few uh, settings that are also uh, applying to, uh, to the next webinars. If you go to the processing toolbox, in my case, they are already changed. But just to show you, go here to the settings, to the general menu. Then there is here, um, let me see, yeah. There is here prefer output file name for layer names. This one is by default unchecked. But since my good practice is that you always save your uh, files, and then for clarity, especially if you have several trials, it is much easier to use the file name in your layers list instead of the name of the tool that you use. And if you do, for example, uh, reclassify, then if you do it three times, you will have three layers called reclassify here. If you check this box, you will get the name of the file in which you store the result. So that's, uh, that's something that might be helpful. Now we are gonna do the interpolations and you find them here under the raster menu. And they're under analysis. And the first one that we're going to do is a simple nearest neighbor interpolation. So I have here the KNMI stations and I keep all the things at default, but I have to choose here the Z value, that's the value you're going to interpolate, so that's very important to fill in something, otherwise it will still run, but with an empty map as a result. You keep the rest as default, you see here that it prints the GDAL command, so GDAL or GUDAL is a very important tool in GIS, uh, and basically QGIS has all kinds of um, dialogues built around GDAL commands, and uh, if you are more fluent with GDAL, you can read this, and you can use this in your own scripts, and uh, for some things it's really useful to use uh, scripting, but that will be a completely different webinar and course. So I'm gonna save here the interpolated result, and go to chapter two, and I call this TNN from nearest neighbor, and then I'm going to run it, and there it is. And you see that it takes the convex hull of your points, and that might not be what you want. So there are other interpolation tools in the toolbox where you can set the extent. I'm not gonna demonstrate it, but that's what you could try. So you can use the IDW, uh, which I'm not going to demonstrate from the menu, but um, you can also use these ones. And in these functions, these tools, it's possible to set the extent to the canvas extent or to the extent of another layer or manually by putting the coordinates. If you use it from the menu, it will by default just set the convex hull of your points. Now, this doesn't look uh, really beautiful yet, so I'm gonna style this one. First, I'm gonna drag my points on top. You see that the labels will remain on top, but not your points, so that's always important. And I'm gonna style this using the layers uh, styling panel. And it, is, uh, it looks discrete, but it's continuous data because the definition of continuous data, and you can see that in my video on the theory of raster data, is that it's uh, discrete data as integer and um, continuous data as decimals. And here, clearly, we have to deal with decimals. So we use single band pseudocolor. And we have to uh, invert the ramp again. So it goes from cool to, uh, to warm. And this is what we in uh, hydrology call uh, Thiessen polygons or Voronoi tessellation. Basically what it does is assign the temperature of the station to the closest pixel. So therefore you get these sharp boundaries. That's what we often do when we interpolate um, met, met data uh, for uh, models. Now I'm going to show you another interpolator. I'm going to uncheck this one. So we start again from the point, and that's the inverse distance weighing. And that is a, an exponential decay function with a, a weight, so a higher weight to when it's near the station, and then the weight of the 
the value uh, decreases when we are further from the net station. So go here to analysis, and now I choose inverse distance to a power. By default, it's uh, quadratic exponential, but you can increase or lower that. So that's if you uh, increase it, then uh, it goes to the third power with the weight. And uh, if you lower it, it uh, goes to the first power, which doesn't make much sense. So also here, we choose the Z value as temperatures. And uh, output data type, you don't need to change it because it's floating point, so that's okay. And I'm gonna save it. It's the same GDOC command, but then with some different options to get inverse distance. There it is, I'm gonna run this. And there it is. There's also a rule of thumb that you never should believe the automatic legends that come out because the software doesn't know what you are looking at and how you want it to be styled. It might even estimate the minimum and maximum value. So never draw conclusions based on the legends that it automatically produces. The good way is to just go to the layer styling panel. If you want to know the distribution of your values, uh, you go here, compute the histogram, then you get the real minimum and maximum. Uh, you can also see it here. These are the minimum and maximum settings. We're going to play a lot with that in other sessions. It's for stretching the colors over a certain range. But here we go to a single band pseudo color. And we can again invert the color ramp. And now we have a more smooth image. So not like the t polygons, but uh, more, more smooth because of the exponential relation. Um, that's nice, but now we don't see the map in the background. And there are some ways to solve that. So let me go to the styling panel. So the classic way is to use the transparency. So you can play here with the opacity, but that works a bit like a haze, as you can see. A better way to do that, and that's really nice about QGIS, is that it has implemented these blending modes. There are many ways of doing blending, but if you want to simply mix one layer with another, then you use multiply. And now we can see our OpenStreetMap layer through the temperature raster. This, it's mixed and we don't get this haze that we have with the, uh, the transparency. So that's a nice result. Um, you can do the same with the nearest neighbor. So one thing that you can do is uh, to copy the style. That should make uh, the legends uh, exactly the same. So paste style. And I check this off and I put this on. So it's also with the blending with the same color ranges. And now the question is which interpolator is the best? Now, when you're with me in class, we will have then some discussion about it interactively. Uh, I will not do that now, but uh, you, you can put your answers in the chat and we can see in the end which you think is better. Is it the, the decent polygons, which is simply assigning the closest value, uh, the, the station's temperature to the closest pixel, or is it inverse distance weighing? which says, well, okay, if we're close, it's probably more like the temperature and then exponentially the weight of the, that decays when we're further uh, from the station. I'm going to give you the answer in a bit. You can still answer in the chat, keep it a bit exciting because we're first going to interpret the results because that's important. With click, click, click in GIS, you can always uh, create a lot of maps and people create a lot of fake news by inverting color ranges, using wrong colors. Um, so it's always important to look at the interpretation. And what we see here is that it's warmer at the coast and it's colder, more inland. And why is that? Well, if you're in hydrology and know about water, we know that the heat capacity of water is uh, much uh, higher than, uh, than of land. So in this case, we can even guess the season. In Netherlands has a, a temperate sea climate. 
And um, that means that in summer, it takes a long time for the water to heat up. And uh, when it gets uh, autumn, it takes some time for the water to cool down. So given the gradient, we are here in autumn. And also given the temperatures, well, if you're not from the Netherlands, you might not know this, but this is not very warm like in summer, but it's also not very cold like in, in winter. And it's in fact early autumn. And we've seen in the, if you check the attribute table, you'll find the, that there was a date uh, field in the, in the table and it's in uh, September. So that makes sense. So that's a way we can explain this gradient from warm to cold from the sea uh, to the land. When we are in spring, we have the opposite signal where the land warms up uh, faster and the sea is still cool. Now the cliffhanger. Yeah, what was the best one? In order to demonstrate that, I'm going to switch to another QGIS project that I prepared before. And we're going to use the 3D viewer of QGIS. That was uh, developed by uh, Lutra Consulting, the same ones that, uh, that sponsor these uh, sessions. And uh, it's really great to visualize your data in a different way. I had to manipulate the data a bit because temperatures are not elevation. But what I want to show you is how how you can display these temperatures as elevation. So high temperature, high elevation, low temperature, low elevation. And I'm gonna show that. So I'm gonna turn this one, and this is the inverse distance weighing. And what you see is all these strange mountains and valleys in your map. You see this color station, just close to that station, the, the pixels become very similar to the value of that station, and then it averages out, it smooths until it comes at the next station, and here it goes up again. Now, yeah, the main question is, is this more natural than Thyssen? In my personal opinion, it's not. It is uh, inverse distance weighing works very well when you have a very, uh, a, mu a much denser grid of uh, measurement points. But if you don't have any assumption on your data, then the Thyssen polygon with this sparse set of data is uh, good enough. And then your best assumption is also that the temperature is like the closest station of any location in your uh, study area. If you know about the trend, like us, you can modify this model and include the spatial trend in it. If you are in areas with elevation, which is not the Netherlands, obviously, then you can add the, the lapse rates to an equation where you incorporate also um, the, uh, um, there you can also incorporate uh, uh, the, the gradient of the elevation. Uh, Kurt asked if I can also show the other one in 3D. Well, I didn't do those conversions, uh, but we have time. I can, I can calculate it. You will see steps. Uh, things can go wrong. It's a live demo, and I didn't test this part, so but we can give it a try. But I'm going to close this window then to create a bit of memory because it's quite intensive. And uh, what I have to do is uh, interpolate this one. So if you, if you want to know the trick, now I'm going to give away some secrets. That's the lucky uh, 88 people here in the, in, the, in the virtual room. So this is the attribute table. I used a, a much larger number for temperatures in order for uh, the 3D viewer to understand that this is elevation. Otherwise, the, the differences are too small. And then I put also a 99 times exaggeration on it to make it clear. That's not producing fake news for you, but that is just to make the visualization better. So I, I start from this same uh, attribute table to do then the nearest neighbor. It's also good you see how I do that again. Um, so that was under analysis and then nearest neighbor. And then I have to choose the column, this one, the big one. And I'm gonna save it. And I'm gonna call this one the TNN. A thousand but this raster file and I run it and there it is so it looks the same but the values are much higher and um, I go to view so I'm first gonna uncheck this one because I don't want to see it like that and then I'm gonna switch this one on and I'm gonna display this with the elevation from the uh, nearest neighbor so I'm going to go to the 3D viewer. 
new 3D map view, you find it under view. There it is. And what you always need to do, also like in arc scene, is uh, to define the elevation. And I want a DEM. And we fool it, we say that's our TNN thousand. And I'm gonna exaggerate the scale to 99, that's needed for this uh, visualization, otherwise you don't see much. And uh, it renders. And now you see, don't look too much at the colors, but now you see the steps. The colors are a bit uh, disturbing it. Uh, let me just remove the colors. But you don't see these strange depressions, but you see steps. So still the question which is more realistic, I still think this one is more realistic uh, when you have no other assumption and you do a quick interpolation. But we can discuss that over the geo beers, of course. Some other interpolators that you can use um, can be found in the processing toolbox. So many people ask about cridging. Don't do that when you have so little points, please. Cridging, it sounds fancy and like that's the best interpolator. Uh, no, it only works when you have really a dense number of points. And uh, all these uh, more advanced methods uh, work very well when you have many points. Otherwise, you should just stick to simple interpolators or build your own interpolation model with the DEM and uh, lapse rates and those kind of things. Yeah. So uh, this was, I think, the whole content. Um, I'm going to switch back to the, to the main screen. Yeah, here we are. I'm going to unmute Kurt so we can start the plenary. OK, there I am. Were there any uh, questions from the audience, uh, Kurt, that uh, you would like to discuss in the plenary? You see people help each other. That's great. Yeah, well, there, there were some good discussions about um, the coordinate system you used and why you didn't use UTM. Um, so you might want to address that. You used a Dutch CRS. Yeah. So there's a nice video on uh, projections, uh, which I will put as a card in YouTube when we are at this point in the, in the video uh, that, that is recorded. So you can simply click on that in the, in the video. Um, basically, choosing your projections is a very important topic. Uh, if it's in latitude, longitude, in geographic coordinate system, you can't really use it for a DEM analysis, for example, because your units are in degrees and your, uh, your X and Y units and your Z from the DEM is in, uh, is in meters. And if you do analysis and use the, the processing tools, uh, then many things can go wrong because some tools assume that they are in the same units. There's also problems with distances and, and other things. So the best way is to reproject your data to a projection. Then you have many choices. There are so many projections that you can use. Um, your first choice, if you work for a country for the government, then of course you use the, um, the projection from the government, from the national projection. So in the Netherlands, everybody working in the authorities or working for authorities use this uh, Amersfoort RD new projection. If you have transboundary, what we will have in the catchment delineation uh, webinar, that will come up uh, in, in two sessions, then uh, you need to choose something that is more uh, globally applicable. And then we normally use UTM. Also, if your country doesn't have a specific national uh, projection, then you can also use UTM or any other global one. So that's important to keep in mind. If it's transboundary, you don't use a national one. If you don't have a national one, you can also use one of these global projections like UTM. But be aware, one UTM projection is not the same as the other because the datum also matters, as I discussed last time. That one uh, was in uh, NAD. In many places, we use WGS84. In East Africa, close to the equator, we use ARC1960. So be careful. Even uh, UTM is not always UTM. And then if your zones are, uh, if it, your area is spread over different zones, then you have to choose one zone, and that's where the largest part of your studies are located. There's, you cannot mix zones. Yeah, and that's uh, where there's a nice feature in QGIS that gives you a, a preview of the valid extent of a CRS. And so you can see if your study area fits squarely within a, the, the valid extent for that CRS or not. And you can use that to help determine which CRS might be the best choice for your project. Yeah, maybe I can show that. So uh, I, can, I can show that with the, um, with the projection property. Um, so if I click here on the EPSG code, 
then we get into that uh, projection selector and you see these boxes. So you can see that UTM zone 31 is over the Netherlands. 32 is uh, more on Germany. So you can, you can simply check all these zones and see where they are on the globe. So you get these previews here. Yeah, there was just a question on um, how to automate what you just went through. And um, so a couple of us answered in chat that you could use the graphical modeler. So um, you can find that from the processing menu in QGIS and you can then, to, it opens up a new window where you can drag data sets and algorithms and recreate an entire workflow. And in so doing, you create basically a, a custom processing algorithm that you can then run um, on any number of data sets to, to, to re, um, repeat that process. Yeah, this is how it looks like. So here you see all kinds of uh, functions and you can connect them and play around with it. Uh, Kurt's book uh, really describes very well how to, uh, to build these things. And we're not seeing it, we, it may oh. be hidden. Oh, that is strange, let me see. I'll share it again. It says it's sharing, something's wrong there. Uh, I think it's uh, because I didn't share the full screen. Here it is. See it now? Yep. So this is the, the modeler, you find it in the processing uh, toolbox. Also in the processing menu, there's a graphical modeler there, you can select it. Okay. Anything? And there was, an, uh, there was another question about um, Goodle and Ogre or GDAL and OGR, depending on how you like to pronounce those. And I described that those are basically libraries for reading and writing vector and raster data sets. So Goodle works with raster and OGR works with vector. And those are, you know, the fact that those are kind of underneath the hood of QGIS is why QGIS can read and write um, just the silly number of file formats that it can. And um, so the, the processing algs that Hans was showing for creating the nearest neighbor surface or the IDW surface are basically um, GUI representations of the command line utilities that come with GDAL, for example. So um, the, they're super handy and the, the, those utilities um, like come with these command line um, utilities that you can open up in a command prompt and execute. And when Hans ran that tool, he pointed out that it gives you the command line syntax for what you're about to run. So you can use that to kind of begin to learn how that syntax might look, and you could copy and paste it into um, the command line to try running it in that environment. So people use those utilities quite a bit for processing data. You can set them up in loops and things like that so that you can process multiple data sets quite rapidly. So um, that's kind of a, a quick and dirty explanation of what Google and Ogre are. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. That's also, uh, I have a free course on my open courseware, gisopencourseware.org on, uh, on GDAL and OGR, Google and Ogre. Um, and I think it's an essential uh, skill uh, in, uh, in universities to, to do scripting, uh, especially if you're in, uh, in engineering or in, in, uh, in geography and dealing with GIS. So uh, in that course, you learn how to loop over outputs from a model and uh, convert the whole folder from one file format and projection to another file format and another projection just in a, in a short time. And uh, that is, that's a very important topic. So I'll, I'll show it when we will uh, do our, uh, our plugs uh, after this. Anything else that came up that we need to, to discuss? Uh, I don't think so. No, I think that pretty okay. much covers it. If someone has something they'd like us to discuss, you can certainly put it into the chat. Okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead with uh, discussing. And in the geo beers, we will even open the microphones. So you can still ask your, your questions. Uh, so get me back to the, to the PowerPoint. Kurt and I just want to point out uh, also materials that we, uh, we also have for you to use. So there's free course materials at uh, uh, IHC Delft Open Courseware, the link I already mentioned, gisopencourseware.org. There you can find a lot of uh, tutorials on, G on QGIS, on Python, and on uh, GDAL. Uh, also on the input app for using the field. Um, there are video, video tutorials. All these videos are also on my YouTube channel. Um, 
at IHE Delft, we also organize uh, physical face-to-face -face -face courses, like our upcoming short course in September uh, on QGIS for hydrological applications. Um, the last two years, uh, Kurt joined as a guest lecturer, and it was great fun. Very diverse group from all over the world, and, uh, and we had a mapathon and processed the data from, from OpenStreetMap, like you also do in another uh, webinar. And um, apart from that, we also have online courses and for those short course and online courses, you can also get the official QGIS certificate and you get our full uh, support, uh, of course. I just wanna show you briefly um, the OpenCourseWare website. It will uh, load the, the site from uh, the IHE Delft uh, OpenCourseWare. There are a lot of other OpenCoursewares on the platform, but the, this is the, the site that I maintain. Um, gives you here some, uh, some information that you can find out, but here you find uh, QGIS for hydrological applications, uh, tutorial um, with uh, course data, etc. It's not as good as the book. The book is really uh, worked out in, in detail and uh, very neat and, and with nice uh, um, explanations of everything. This is also nice stuff, but it's for free. And this open courseware comes uh, with the disclaimer that it comes without support. So you're free to use it, but yeah, be a bit hesitant with asking us all the time uh, for solutions. Uh, we can, of course, uh, answer simple questions when you post it on social media, but uh, we cannot do private consultancy. Uh, uh, that will take all our time uh, that we want to spend on developing good material and, and teaching. So this is the one of, on Google that I uh, explained. So um, you can find your course material also on a batch conversion of files. There's a Python 3 tutorial. Very useful to learn Python, especially if you're in GIS. And there are a lot of other resources mentioned here that you can take a look at. Uh, if you just want to start like your first time with Python, you can do, use this uh, Jupyter Notebook via Binder. You don't need to install anything and you just go ahead with it. Very nice are the tutorials for hydrologists from Hatari Labs, um, from Sal Montaya on linking groundwater to GIS and Python. Really fantastic what he's doing. He's organizing a lot of free webinars too, but also from the other QGIS uh, colleagues. And uh, PC Raster, very nice tool to do uh, map algebra. So the things you're gonna do next week, we can easily do it uh, also in PC Raster, but then through scripting, command line based or in Python. So have a look at that if you're interested in. And the field surveys that I mentioned, I developed this with uh, Saber from uh, Lutra Consulting. And it's basically a full uh, click through tutorial, how to set up a project for use in the field. Um, synchronize it to the Mergen cloud and how to use uh, the app on your smartphone to collect data. And, uh, yeah, really full uh, uh, tutorial, including uh, videos. So I hope you're gonna use also these materials and um, I'm gonna back, go back to the presentation and Kurt can also present some of his uh, work. Oh yeah, so I just wanted to do a quick um, announcement. I've been um, building this program called Community Health Maps with the, the U.S. National Library of Medicine for several years. And it's been very successful, um, but the uh, U.S. government is ending support for this program. So they've turned all the materials over to me and I've uh, set up a new website, communityhealthmaps.org. And going forward, I'm going to be managing this program myself. And this is basically um, setting up tools like QGIS and other open source tools um, for doing community health mapping, public health sorts of applications. And um, I'm planning on doing a webinar in the next month on community health maps to introduce it to people. And I might even in, uh, think about um, some way of incorporating COVID-19 into this to show people how we could work with some of the data that's out there with COVID-19 and QGIS as an example. Um, there will also be open courseware available on this site. There are some lab exercises up there right now that need to be updated. Um, but I also have a, a two-day course on vector-borne disease surveillance using QGIS that will be posted to this site in the coming weeks. So I just wanted to um, point that out, make everyone of it, um, aware of it, and um, it will be growing over the summer as I'm able to um, work on it. That's great, Kurt. Thanks. So uh, before we go to the geo beers, uh, for next week, we're going to do chapter three of the book. If you want to prepare it a bit, um, there's also videos about the topic on, on the YouTube channel. It's about spatial analysis using map algebra, basically uh, an exercise to, to check the proximity uh, to certain uh, land use features and to do Boolean uh, logic, uh, work a lot with Boolean maps. 
to uh, to find out which uh, wells in this study area are uh, less accessible for the people who live there. Um, a short note on the timing next week because we switch here uh, this weekend to summertime in uh, in Europe, so we are not on CET anymore, but in CEST. So that will be UTC plus two, I guess. So anyways, you need to check uh, the time. We'll be again with the webinar at 9 p.m. CEST, European summertime. So it's time for GeoBeer. So it was great fun uh, last time. So uh, I'm gonna open up uh, the floor for, for you to discuss.